Okay, second section, rigid objects in equilibrium. We talked about equilibrium before, I believe it was in chapter four, and we defined an equilibrium to be when an object had no acceleration. Equivalently, uh, if an object has no acceleration, since the net force equals the mass times the acceleration, the right-hand side of that equation is zero, therefore the left-hand side of the equation has to be zero. So there's no net force acting on the object. That's equilibrium. But now we're throwing in an extra wrinkle and saying, well, what if it's turning? And what about the torques? And the answer is that we are going to define equilibrium to be same as before. There's no net force acting on the object in the x or the y direction, and also that there's no net torque. So we add up all the torques on the object, and if those add up to zero, noting that the torques need to be positive if it's a counterclockwise rotation or negative for a clockwise rotation, they can cancel each other out, one pushing this way, one pushing that way, and you can get zero. That's equilibrium. Let's do an example. So a diver on the end of a, a diving board. Now she's not jumping up and down. She's just stationary on her toes, not moving, not, uh, nothing happening. So there's her, uh, her weight. Stands at the end of a diving board of length 3.9 meters. So that's shown here. And the board has negligible weight and is supported by a fulcrum 1.4 meters away from the left end. So that's this number here. So here's the axis. Here's the fulcrum that's supporting it. Find the forces at the bolt. So the bolt is what is holding it in place uh, at the location of the axis of rotation. We want to find the forces. This is a really cool problem. Um, these are really, really fun problems. So the first thing in, in trying to solve a problem like this, you follow the steps that you do in solving force problems. The first thing we're going to do is identify an object that we want to, ex we want to look at the forces on. The object, in this case, is the diving board itself. So what forces act on that diving board? Well, with the woman standing on the end here, her weight uh, will be pushing down whatever her weight is, uh, exerting a torque in this direction. That um, torque tends to rotate the diving board. About this axis, it tends to rotate the diving board clockwise. So that's a clockwise rotation. So we would expect that one to come in as a negative. Here's the second force. It's the force of the fulcrum pushing up on the board, stopping the board from going down. So that one is upward on the board. We'll call it F2. It's uh, at a location L2. And, we, and this one tends to rotate the board clockwise. I'm sorry counterclockwise. So we expect this one to be positive and this one to be negative. Let's actually add up the torques. There is one other force, this force F1. Now let's think about that one. That, what is the direction of the force of the bolt on the board? If the board, if a bolt were not there, then this woman pushing down here would cause this end of the board to come down, this end of the board to come up, so it's the bolt that stops it from coming up. Therefore, that bolt must exert a force that's down. And that's this force right here. All right, let's put together the, uh, the net torque on this, on this board. We're going to have to figure out the torque due to each of these three forces, F1, F2, and the weight. Let's start uh, with F2. Um, the torque, as you remember, it's a plus or minus the force times the lever arm. So for F2, 
the force will be F2. For F2, the lever arm, the distance between the axis and the line of action of the force is 1.4 meters. So that's this guy here. And it's a, clockwise, a counterclockwise torque, meaning positive. So we're going to have a positive out here. Let's look at the weight. Her weight, we know, it's 530 newtons. So I've placed that in here. Her distance, her lever arm, is 3.9 meters, just like we talked about. And we put in a negative sign here because it's a clockwise torque, and this is counterclockwise. Okay? And um, that is supposed to equal zero. Now, you say, well, hang on, there's one more force going on here. So let's take a look at that force. F1. We don't know what it, what it is yet, but we can calculate its lever arm. What is its lever arm? Well, here's the line of action of the force, and I need the distance between this line and this point. What's that distance? Well, you say the line goes right through the point. Therefore, there is no distance between them, and I say, you're right. In this case, for this force, the lever arm is zero. So if the lever arm is zero, then the torque produced by that force is zero. So the lever arm is zero, the torque has to be zero. All that says is that if you, anything you do right on the axis, pushing on the axis, just like when we talked about pushing on the hinge of a door, you're not going to open a door by pushing on the hinge. You have to get away from the hinge. You have to have a lever arm. So this, this, one, this force does not produce a torque about that point. So we could add in that other torque, but it'll be zero. Now we're told that um, she's in equilibrium. If she's in equilibrium, then the sum of her torques must be zero. And uh, setting this whole thing here equal to zero allows us to solve for F2, and we get 1480 newtons. That gives us F2. But equilibrium also not is, is not only concerned about rotational equilibrium, but also translational equilibrium. And in that case, we're thinking about the fact that these two forces pulling down on the board had darn well better equal the force that's pushing up. Otherwise, if this force that's pushing up exceeds the sum of these two forces pulling it down, then that, that diving board is going to move up and it's going to levitate. And that's embarrassing. You don't want that for a diving board. So let's actually look at the forces in the y direction. Let's choose this for our y-axis. We don't have any forces in the x direction, so we don't have to worry about the forces in the x direction. So forces in the y direction. Well, we've got F2 and the plus y. There's F2. We already calculated it, and it can't, comes in with the plus sign. We've got the weight in the minus y direction. That's the minus 530. And then F1 also in the minus y direction. And that all has to be equal to zero because we're in equilibrium. And setting that whole thing equal to zero allows us to solve for F1. That's how you do these equilibrium problems. Very powerful. Deltoid muscle exerts an 1840 Newton force on an arm that weighs 31 Newtons. What is the dumbbell weight? Okay. If the if the arm is considered to be uniform, um, that its weight distribution is uniform. Now it isn't. It's a little bit more massive up here than it is down there. But we're just going to treat it as if it were uniformly distributed. And so what we'll do, actually, um, we're not even assuming that. What, what we're actually going to do, sorry, is we know where this uh, center mass of the arm is located. It's located close to that shoulder muscle, um, about 0.28 meters. The total length of the arm out to where the dumbbell is held is 0.62 meters. So this is the weight of the arm. We're going to consider it to be uh, as if it were located at the center of mass of the arm. 
okay? Like we talked about a few chapters ago, center of mass. So that's the weight of the arm, pulling the arm down. Then there's the weight of the dumbbell in the guy's hand, trying to pull it down as well. So there's that one. Then there's the force of the delto deltoid muscle. That's this M right here. And then there are going to be some forces on the axis of rotation. We don't know what those are going to be. Um, so now we want to try and find what the dumbbell weight is. It's kind of a weirdo problem because normally you'd know what the weight is and we want to try and find the force that's exerted by the deltoid muscle. But nevertheless, we proceed forward. Let's do some of the torques about this axis. Well, I've got the weight of the dumbbell, and it is a clockwise torque. The weight of the arm is clockwise, so that'll be a negative, that'll be a negative. And then this uh, force exerted by the deltoid muscle it tends to hold the arm up, so it's, it's bringing the arm up like this. And so it's actually a, clock, a counterclockwise torque, and it should come in as positive. And sure enough, uh, here it is, the um, torque exerted by the deltoid muscle is the, the, that M just stands for the actual force force exerted by the deltoid muscle. So it's just a force. And then we need a lever arm. And how are we going to find it? Well, this is a right triangle. And the angle here is 13 degrees, this little angle right there. And we have a 0.15 meter to the attachment point of this muscle, between the joint and the attachment point. That's 0.15 meters. So in this little triangle, I know this is 0 0.15, this, this side here. That's actually the hypotenuse of this tiny little triangle. And I'm looking for this side over here. And it's the side, this side right here is the side opposite to the angle 13. And so we can certainly say that um, the sine of 13 degrees is the opposite LM over the hypotenuse. And that says, so sine 13 is the side opposite over um, 0 0.15 meters. So we can solve that for the lever arm, and which is 0.15 times sine 13. There we go, right there. So that's how to do that trigonometry. Um, plug that in here. We can actually plug in the uh, force of the deltoid muscle here. We're going to set all these torques equal to zero. These guys both come in the, the weight of the arm and the weight of the uh, dumbbell. Both come in with minus signs as we talked about before. So both of those are negative. And then all we have to do is plug in the numbers. LA, we know, to be this uh, 0 0.280. LD is this uh, whole length of the arm. Plug in the numbers, and that gives you the force, um, or the, actually the weight of the dumbbell in this particular problem.